afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Getting the Vaccine to the Communities that Need It Most webinar. Before we begin, I would like to highlight the main features of the Zoom webinar interface. At the bottom of your screen is the Zoom menu bar. Here you will find the Q&A box. We encourage you to use this feature to submit questions at any point during the meeting. We will leave time for Q&A after the presentations. At the bottom of your menu bar, you will also find a chat box. Please use the chat box to report any technical issues you may be experiencing. We will respond to those concerns as they come in. Additionally, live captioning is available during today's broadcast. Simply click the CC icon from your bottom menu bar to use this feature. Finally, please be aware that today's meeting is being recorded. With those announcements made, I will turn it over to Lauren. Thanks so much, Kim. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lauren Pongan, and I use she and her pronouns. I am the National Director of the Diverse Elders Coalition, and at the Diverse Elders Coalition, we advocate for policies and programs that improve aging in our communities as racially and ethnically diverse people, American Indians and Alaska Natives, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, and or transgender people. So throughout the pandemic, we've seen the exacerbation of existing inequalities in the spread of COVID-19, in access to care and services, and in more blatant cases like anti-Asian hate crimes and rhetoric around the spread of the virus. So it's no surprise that these inequities are part of what we're navigating as we move into this next phase, which is organizing to get our communities fully vaccinated. Some of the inequalities that we're seeing in the communities that the Diverse Elders Coalition serves are lack of vaccine locations and high poverty and under-resourced communities. Um, that's particularly also important in our rural communities. Lack of vaccine information, including translated materials into languages other than English for our limited English proficient communities. Technological setbacks that affected vaccine registration or access to information around vaccines. And then more recently, vaccine access for our aging loved ones that are homebound or isolated. In this webinar, we'll get to hear from several, several expert panelists about the ways that advocates and, the community, and communities are overcoming some of these health inequities in vaccine distribution. After we hear from each speaker, as well as at the very end of the presentation, we'll have opportunities for Q&A from the audience. So as Kim mentioned, please feel free to use that Q&A function for any questions related to the presentations or the chat for technical questions. Um, this webinar is also gonna feature polling questions and we really appreciate your feedback through the polls because it will help us guide um, some of our future events and make sure that we are on target with what we're presenting to you. It's my pleasure at first to introduce Dr. Yanira Cruz. She's the president and CEO of the National Hispanic Council on Aging. Dr. Cruz is one of the nation's foremost advocates and spokespersons for diverse older adults, and she's nationally recognized for her commitment and leadership on behalf, on behalf of diverse older adults. Um, we're really pleased to have her as well as a representation of a member of the Diverse Elders Coalition. So welcome, Dr. Cruz. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, and um, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. I, I am so thrilled that we are focusing right now on this very important topic of vaccines and also to express our gratitude to BIO for helping us um, sponsor this event. And thank you to the Diverse Elders Coalition, Lauren and your, and your team for putting this together. Um, so, you know, vaccines are one of the greatest developments in public health and, and uh, it allows populations to stay healthy and live longer. And, and the COVID-19 vaccine is, you know, our latest example of, um, of a vaccine that um, can prevent illness uh, and, uh, and death among our populations. So we are very grateful that um, this development has taken place and that we have this available. Um, now, despite the availability of the vaccines, we know that certain populations are falling behind with regards to immunizations. And this is not um, the first time this has happened in terms of you know, low vaccination rates. We know that um, there are other vaccines where certain populations like black and brown communities, Latinos, um, are not getting the vaccines that they need at the rates that we in the public health community would like to see it. And there's different reasons for, for this and I'll get to it in a little bit. And I'm sure my colleagues um, in the panel will go 
deeper into this, some, of, some of these reasons. So um, the, first of all, the lack, lack of access, which uh, Lauren alluded to, lack of access to, to healthcare in general is, um, is one of the reasons why uh, we're, many of our communities are not getting the vaccines. Misinformation, uh, myths around, um, around um, side effects or harms, harm that can be uh, related to the vaccine is another reason why some, are, some of our members um, and uh, community members are not getting the vaccine. Then, you know, there's a digital divide. The digital divide is keeping many, many uh, diverse populations from accessing, registering for the vaccine um, and, um, and, and, signing, and signing up uh, successfully to, to get vaccinated. The lack of transportation is also another reason why, um, particularly in, in, in rural areas where distances are, are, are significant, but even in, in urban areas, we are seeing that uh, transportation is an issue for older adults. Clearly transportation has been an issue from the very beginning. Um, and then there's this mistrust in the vaccines. There's a history that we cannot deny of unethical practices um, that were carried out among many of our populations. And so it is normal for many of us to feel not safe as a result uh, of those unethical practices that have taken place in the past. So um, the National Hispanic Council on Aging has been very fortunate to hold focus groups to understand, um, to understand the knowledge, to understand the attitudes and the behaviors around, um, sorry about my dog, Cleopatra, she, she gets like that. Um, but um, it's, been, it's been great to see, to understand the knowledge, the attitudes, the behaviors around um, vaccines among, among Latinos. And um, I'm delighted to, to report to you that um, many Latinos and most Latinos actually want to get vaccinated. This is what we're hearing through the focus groups. So that's really good news. And, um, and we're, we're thrilled to hear that. Uh, but we do, we, do not, we do know that as of, as of last week, we still have some barriers that, that need to be addressed in order for us to have a, uh, the largest percentage of our populations vaccinated. So, um, so we do know that Many vaccine sites are requesting government issue IDs, and that is um, getting in the way because you know there are individuals who just don't have the government issue IDs. Now um, we have been in touch with the um, with the Biden administration, and they have directed states not to request government issue IDs, and yet there are still some locations that continue to do that. Um, some locations are also requesting health insurance. And again, it's, um, the, the administration has also offered guidance to states not to require health insurance in order to get the vaccine. Um, and, uh, and then some, some churches. Some churches are also uh, discouraging their, their members from getting the vaccine. So I think, uh, that those are some important uh, items to keep in mind. We still need to address and, uh, and we still need to continue to work on transportation. We need to still continue to work on the digital divide. And as Lauren indicated, we need to create more locations in areas where our communities are, are residing and, and are um, living so that we have uh, easy access to, to the vaccines, as well as the hours of operations. Many of our community members are working you know, during the week. And so we need access to a vaccine, perhaps on the weekends or in the evenings when, uh, when folks are available to, to go for the vaccines. So you know, since the very beginning, the National Hispanic Council on Aging reaffirmed its commitment to getting accurate information that is science-based, that is objective to our communities. Um, so we have done this through, through webinars, through virtual 
town halls, and some of you here on this webinar have been part of those efforts throughout the pandemic, and, and uh, we're grateful for that. We have done uh, sessions on just overall COVID-19 and, and the vaccine, food insecurity, which, you know, as you know, um, food, food insecurity um, is a big challenge, particularly uh, during this pandemic. Mental health has been another issue that we have addressed as it relates, mental health as it relates to the pandemic. Um, and just addressing myths and concerns impacting Hispanics. So those are some of the examples um, on the type of, it, of webinars and vir virtual town halls we have carried out. I also wanna share with you today that um, we have created a, multilingual, um, a multilingual resource center to address uh, any concerns to help folks uh, sign up register for for the vaccine so it's a um, it's a phone call away and we're making this available in three languages in in english in spanish and in portuguese um so so that is um the number for that is is in our social media but perhaps um at some point here we can also post it the number is 866-488-7379 that is the number to call for um, for for help for getting help uh, in terms of transportation, in terms of registering online. Um, our team will help uh, folks sign up um, so that we can get as many people vaccinated as possible. And also through this resource center, we have been able to partner with embassies, with churches, with uh, beauty salons, and other key um, you know partners that are helping to mobilize and, um, and engage as many people as possible into the vaccine process. And finally, you know, we have come a long way um, since, since the pandemic started. Uh, we, have, we, have, we still have a, a long way to go. We have a lot of work to do, uh, particularly to bring about health equity in our communities. We need to uh, continue to look to our work from an equity lens. Um, we need to think big and bold to ensure that we all enjoy our golden years. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. We now have our first poll question. So our first question is, what brought you to this webinar? So if you could go ahead and select an answer there. All right, we're gonna go ahead and close the poll. It looks like we have a mix, um, but the majority of attendees here are looking for resources for vaccine access for my community and looking to learn more about diverse communities and vaccines. Thank you everyone for participating in the poll. And I will turn it back over to Warren. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, Dr. Cruz. I it's always really grounding to hear just those firsthand examples, like things like people who are working um, nine to five during the week and really need those adjustments like weekend and evening hours. So thanks always for centering our communities in, in these discussions. Um, next up, I'm really excited to introduce our first panelist who represents another one of the Diverse Elders Coalition's member organizations, the National Indian Council on Aging, and that is Sarah Pearsall. Sarah is Program Manager for the National Indian Council on Aging, or NICOA's Senior Community Service Employment Program in North Dakota. A professional musician and instructor for over 20 years, Sarah has worked as an advocate for access to education for refugee families, support services for homeless individuals, two-spirit LGBTQ plus equality, the preservation of traditional faith and whole, whole health practices across diverse cultures, and mental health awareness for all. Through her association with Presentation International, 
Sarah has also worked on social justice initiatives that range from equitable housing to human trafficking, wherever there is a need. So I'm looking forward to just to introducing Sarah and hearing from her. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I use she and her pronouns myself and couldn't be um, more honored to be here today. Um, I just wanna speak a little bit about the National Council on Aging's CSEP program. You can hit the next slide, I believe here. Is it changing? We can skip that slide. <laughs> no one needs to see that one. Um, we, NICOA began in 1976. I, had, I apologize, go ahead and hit the next slide. Had a couple extra slides. I just want to share our mission is to advocate for the improved comprehensive health, social services, and economic well being for American Indian and Alaskan Natives. My CSEP program, if you want to hit the next slide, includes all of our elders. Um, we are funded by the Department of Labor. If you would hit the next slide for me, please. And our focus is to work with low income seniors to help them overcome a variety of barriers, help them increase their skills so that they can find employment. You can hit the next slide for me, please. On to our current topic for today, getting the vaccines to communities that need it most. My personal educational and vocational background is actually in scientific medical research, and that has allowed me to serve our communities in some very unique ways. I had the wonderful opportunity to work with our local public health officials in helping to identify strategic ways in how we can distribute the vaccine in North Dakota to try and address some of the barriers that Dr. Cruz just discussed. I've spent my evenings and weekends on the phone trying to reach out to local community individuals and hear some of the things that we found successful <laughs> and some of the things we found um, became a really great learning experience for us. You can hit the next slide for me, please. I'm gonna actually skip over these because I'm assuming Jennifer is gonna share some of these statistics in the PowerPoint. So that's the purpose of including these here. I could spend a half an hour on some of the statistics that you can find on the North Dakota Department of Health website. So if you would go ahead, Jennifer, please, and skip ahead the next few slides. Next one, please. And the next one. Great, and we can hit the next one as well. Great. So I know most of you are aware that there is a website provided nationally by the CDC. I do just want to touch on a little piece here for anyone who might still be out there and hear my voice and is struggling or have fine frustrations in getting the vaccine. This website is great. They did a wonderful job on it. The one thing I find for most people is really frustrating is the logistics behind this effort have been massive. And the one thing that it can account for is the vaccines that are received by a particular pharmacy, public health, healthcare um, provider, et cetera. But what it can't account for, unfortunately, is the vaccines that aren't used. So those vaccines that unfortunately go to waste at the end of the day. So I know for some people that that can be really frustrating. And if anybody out there has a great idea how to overcome that piece, maybe on that technical backside, I encourage you to reach out to the CDC. <laughs> you can go ahead and that next slide for me, please. So how do we serve those that need it most? Here are some of the things that I've seen our community partners do really well and some of the things that we've uh, learned from. Uh, this, of course, is not an exhaustive list and we are still working to reach those, you know, many individuals who need that vaccine. We can go ahead and hit the next slide for me. Our community partnerships have been probably the most important piece that we have, being creative with those community partnerships. I think our biggest learning lesson was to be an organization that didn't try to do everything. It was really important for us to recognize our strengths <laughs> and perhaps utilize those pieces, but understand or have a really keen awareness of our weaknesses as well and be able to delegate some of those services. You can go ahead and hit the next slide for me, please. Lots of pictures. <laughs> um, I'll touch on some of those creative community pieces in the end, like Dr. Cruz said, 
um, media, especially in the first few phases of that pandemic with the groups that I work with, which is our elders, became a really important piece as to how to best navigate um, some of those pieces. And it was very tricky. You can go ahead and hit the next slide for me. I think over any generation, it was the trickiest objective was there was no one size fits all plan across generations or cultural groups. You can hit the next slide for me, please. If you have access to the internet or social media, there was stuff everywhere. And it was really helpful for maybe those people who have access to the internet. You can hit the next slide. Here's just a couple images. I apologize, they're not hard links, but you can find these on Facebook or um, even on the Department of Health website. And there's some great videos on there, I think for helping kind of educate some of those communities those videos became really helpful for some individuals and, and organizations. Uh, you can hit the next slide for me, please. Care coordinators. We talked about homebound outreach. In our area, our care coordinators have been our best partnerships. So whether it was you know, trusted individuals of various communities. Here in the Fargo-Moorhead area, we have large groups of refugees, specifically Sudanese and Bhutanese communities. We took their kind of social leader, as well as HR managers. We had faith leaders, we had caregivers, we had community directors, and we brought them in, provided them with the training that they needed in regards to the vaccine, answers to common questions, items like that. And they were able to go back to the communities that they served, not only as a trusted individual, but I think the biggest piece was they were able to speak the language that their community understood. And that was a really huge piece. Um, our public health officials provided them with care kits, gloves, sanitizer, masks, and literature. We also worked with our community partnerships like Meals on Wheels and some of our senior care facilities to reach out to see who might be some of our homebound individuals that, that needed some of that access. And that is a really tricky piece still, that we're trying to find more creative ways to reach out to some of those homebound individuals because that has become a very difficult uh, dem demographic to try and I identify, you know, some of those people are, especially if they don't have regular services. You can go ahead and hit the next slide for me, please. Being creative was a must. This is probably one of my favorite <laughs> um, images from the last year. You can hit the next slide for me. In North Dakota and Minnesota, our tribal partners or uh, tribal groups were probably one of the most successful early on in the pandemic to vaccinate the large majority of their groups. They had a strategy that was specifically Midwest. <laughs> they offered the vaccine at a grocery store in combination with a coupon. You give anybody a coupon in the Midwest <laughs> and that's a winner. <laughs> and so that was really helpful. I think for them, you can hit the next slide. Transportation-wise, I think I, space-wise, excuse me, we had places that people knew in town. Gordman's is an old retail store that no, no longer exists, but we were able to use that space and everyone knew where it was. We used churches, event centers were very common. You can hit the next slide for me, please. It was really helpful that Matt Bus still to this day offers free rides. We have senior care services that put our seniors as priority if they were going to their vaccine appointments. So we were able to call them and partner with them to make sure that if we got, if anyone received a call from one of our seniors that they were able to take care of that need. Uh, we have a local healthcare facility that is building a bus like the one that you see down below that is Roll Up Your Sleeves, Minnesota, and is a bus that will be traveling to various rural communities. And they kind of market it in a way to make it fun. Um, there's some more information on the link in that page. You can go ahead and hit the next slide for me, please. So this was a tricky piece. Communication is always tricky. That's why I found this image to be helpful. <laughs> um, early on, I worked um, 
was very involved with helping train people to be able to communicate to our seniors on the phone. That can be a quick learning experience, or at least it was for us. I think it was important to realize that we're all still in the middle of a very long crisis. And whenever we talk to people, we need to address them in that manner. During these conversations, it was also important to continue that creative mindset. We always wanted to stay positive. We wanted to keep things short. We wanted to be genuine. It needed to be all right to tell somebody that we didn't have all the answers, but that we were there to work with them. We understood their frustrations and we would work to find out the answer. Um, an angry person can always be helped. In fact, those were the opportunities when we learned the most as to how to help the public. A large majority of our individuals do not have the basic understanding of science or biology. We learned that many seniors actually like to text message, which was super exciting. Um, most importantly, we had to address it as the vaccine being a choice. I think the current issue that we are finding right now in North Dakota specifically is those items of vaccine hesitancy. Um, when we can present it as a choice that gives us that opportunity to move forward, to have that important dialogue so that people can feel like they're being addressed um, where they're at. You can go ahead and hit the next slide for me, please. I realize I'm probably running out of time, but the one thing that I do want to touch on, especially since I know most people on this call um, are some of our community providers, but taking that opportunity to manage burnout <laughs> and to motivate self-advocacy, I think is one of the pieces that I've learned how to, how I personally plan to move forward with the participants that I serve in, in the future. Uh, you can go ahead and hit the next slide. So I think it's important just to remember that 90% of the decisions people make are emotional and not factual. I am not gonna expand more on that in the interest of time. I would just like to move forward in the next slide, please, Jennifer. I already touched on vaccine hesitancy. Empathy is just going to be a huge piece of not only how we address others, but also how we address I think ourselves. And I think that's going to be a big piece of how we try and look at all strategic maneuvers as we move forward. You can hit the next slide for me, please. So I just wanna use one final analogy that I've learned over the past five months. And that is to motivate that piece of self-advocacy. I use probably a poor analogy of the grocery store doesn't know that you need eggs. Mm -hmm. And I think that we work a lot with people who have these hidden barriers. And I am empathetic. People fight these secret battles. Oftentimes just even asking for help can seem to be too much, but I feel like this piece needs to be addressed. So the one thing that I've asked for most individuals, and this is North Dakota, um, but the one thing that I, when I speak with elders who have not yet received their vaccine, a part of me is hoping to hear some secret answer <laughs> to what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And typically the response is, well, no one has called me. And I feel like we can do a better job of helping the people we serve to advocate for their own self health. We are all our own best health advocate. And I think reminding you can hit the next slide for me, please. Finding a strategic way with the groups that we work with to help them identify their value, the community organizations that we work with to help remind them daily of their value. And at the end of the day, to remind ourselves of the value that we have can really help address some of those internal battles so that when we do need to reach out and ask for help, we can feel like we have that little bit of extra motivation to do so in whether it's in the effort of getting the vaccine, whether it's in your personal health care, um, or whether it's a different barrier. Um, everyone has value just because they exist. And I know every organization on here is great about addressing those items, but it would be 
great as we move forward to find more strategic ways to include some of those conversations of addressing um, that reinforcement. Thank you guys very much. There's my contact information. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I love I love hearing successful strategies and community stories. And also, I just appreciate the levity you brought to a topic. You know, we're all it's been a, a nonstop COVID news, as you mentioned, but I really appreciate it. Just kind of the highlights of successful partnerships, things people don't expect and and even finding small joy and like doing a mask demonstration on your dog. So <laughs> thanks for sharing that. Really appreciate it. Um, we will, yeah, we'll, we'll feature a couple of questions for you at the end, but please feel free folks to reach out to Sarah if you have specific questions, it's her email address. Um, and NICO is an amazing resource um, for reaching the American Indian Alaska Native community. So thank you, Sarah. We'll revisit at the end um, for the Q&A. But next up, I would love to introduce Dr. Pachecos, who has, has many years of working as a physician and in public health. He served as director of the Center for Health Promotion at the National Council of La Raza, which is now Unidos Us or Unidos US. He has worked as a private consultant in various health research and training projects in Latin America with the Pan American Health Organization and other agencies. So welcome, Dr. Pacheco. Hi, how are you? Good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? Yep, we can hear you. I was gonna say, can you hear me at all? Yes, <laughs> thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to the diverse other coalitions and all the partners. I appreciate this. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, I was going to discuss the, you know, the importance of getting vaccinated and of course addressing some of the challenges of getting the COVID vaccine. Uh, my focus will be uh, on, on Latinos, uh, a community that uh, uh, NACOA works with uh, and that I perhaps know the, the best. Uh, next slide. Let me just start by to, to set the scene with uh, some uh, facts related about the COVID pandemic. And of course, this is probably the deadliest uh, US public health crisis in, in, in more than a century. Uh, it, you know, started in China, although, you know, the source, the exact source is still uh, in question, uh, whether, whether it was natural or perhaps even, uh, you know, laboratory made, you know, or that escaped from a laboratory. You didn't make viruses in the laboratory, but this may have escaped. But in any case, uh, it is caused by a virus of the corona family. That's, that's a little bit important because there have been all other corona family viruses that have caused significant disease. Uh, but have been uh, contained, uh, you, you know, you may remember from years past the, the MERS, which was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, SARS, the Severe Acute Syndrome. So scientists had been on top of this family of viruses. However, COVID-19 is a new, a new species, a new, well, not a new species, a new member of this family. That's why it's many times it's called the novel. One other thing we should take into account that the difference between now and let's say 10 or more years is that biotechnology has uh, uh, advanced, has improved the methods of uh, vaccine production. In the old day, uh, old years, which was you know no more than maybe 20 years ago, vaccines had, had to be grown and cultured in eggs and took months for that to happen. And so it took you know months and years for vaccines to develop. However, with modern technology, we have been able to uh, accelerate this process and uh, brought on a vaccine much sooner than you know it was even hoped for. Next slide. Just uh, another quick review of the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in the nation. And uh, that uh, it, my numbers will limit themselves to the United States, the nation. So far, there have been you know 32 million cases, uh, over 500,000 deaths. Uh, if you put that into, into perspective, the AIDS epidemic, which started in the 1980s, in 1981, so it's been 40 years, has been responsible for, you know, about 700,000 deaths, whereas COVID has killed uh, over half a million, over half 500,000 in, 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 in a year. And that, uh, that is even with uh, all the uh, strong preventive measures, such as using a mask or distancing, 
washing hands, and of course with the vaccine. So we can see how this deadly this disease was. Uh, so far, about 60% of adults have received at least one dosage of the vaccine with the vaccination. About 62% of non-Hispanic whites have received at least one vaccination. However, uh, Latinos, only 30% Latino adults have re received at least one vaccination and only 12% are fully vaccinated. And as, we, and as we saw from Sarah Pearsall's slide, uh, the resistance or hesitancy uh, to get vaccinated among Latinos is really not, it's, it's low, it's one of the lowest, it's 9%. I mean, you, 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 know, you, you wish it was even lesser, but it, it's uh, relatively low compared to other groups, 9%, I think our slide show. Next slide. <clears throat> Well, the, 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 the rule of vaccines have been around with us for, for, for decades. Uh, anybody who's been, a, who's been a child before will remember that very, very well. But they have been with us for years, for decades. Uh, we know they are safe, they are effective. And they pro uh, pro uh, protect us against very serious deadly diseases that we have lost fear of them because we don't see them uh, very much uh, more, thank God. Uh, uh, how do they work? Well, they, pro they prompt our immune system to, pre to produce defensive antibodies against this particular uh, viruses and bacteria. So therefore, when you get attacked uh, or when you become exposed to this virus, uh, you already have your defenses ready uh, in your body and do not allow it, uh, the prevention to pro the infection to progress. Uh, uh, vaccines, you know, they can, some of them contain killed uh, viruses, others contain weakened viruses or bacteria, and others like, like, like the, uh, the uh, COVID vaccine contains harmless pieces of these specific germs. So they definitely cannot cause the disease. And uh, let's not forget that millions of children and adults have been routinely vaccinated annually for decades. So we are very, uh, we are very uh, uh, familiar with uh, with um, uh, vaccines. Next slide. As we can see, the uh, vaccines have prevented, have, have prevented and have protected us from very, very uh, serious and deadly diseases. Most people don't remember these except from textbooks. But for example, in my case, uh, uh, having come from Bolivia, I remember as a child seeing some people that were totally disfigured by, by smallpox, totally disfigured, scarred faces. Uh, two or three people in my hometown, those disfigured by smallpox. And, and those were the lucky ones. You know, those were the lucky ones because they survived. Many more were killed. Same thing, I have uh, probably two relatives, uh, one uh, that have uh, lost, uh, that have paralysis, they, 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 they use wheelchairs as a result of uh, uh, polio. Once again, we hardly ever see that. Now, due to vaccines, uh, uh, smallpox was eradicated and um, uh, polio uh, practically eradicated from the Western world. There are a few wild cases in Afghanistan, Pakistan, those places. But here's, uh, this is a list, and of course COVID is in there because it is a very, very serious disease. But once again, uh, they protect us against very vicious diseases that have a, uh, you know, been around for, for, for decades. Um, we routinely get the tetanus vaccine once again, because it's very hard to survive tetanus. Um, next slide. Well, the question, uh, you know, it's hard to measure uh, uh, how uh, the, 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 the low figures of Latino vaccination, is it, is it uh, uh, because of hes hesitancy or lack of access, you know, and uh, and so some you know some of the issues that have to be addressed or resolved and are being addressed are being resolved are those fears and doubts about the vaccine, a kind of a wait and see attitude, you know, um, uh, 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 you know we'll we'll see what happens kind of thing. And the problem is in the process you can get infected and you may not die, but you can pass it to an older person or a more delicate person and and they could die or just. Or, or survive it with, with, with significant sequela. Uh, many things about the Latinos is that they, they just don't know where and how to get vaccinated. The process is still too complicated. I've used, um, I'm a resident of Virginia, I used a website in Virginia to register and it was complicated to navigate. So imagine somebody else who's not familiar with navigating these kinds of websites. It was very difficult, really difficult to navigate. And there was a lot of places where I had to enter and this and that. 
uh, then, you know, Latino are, are, are a young population. And of course they, they're young and they're healthy and they're strong and that's how they feel that they're not going to be uh, 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 infected by this virus. They're not gonna be affected by this virus because of they, 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 they feel as healthy and strong. And they, many are unaware that the vaccine is, is free. They think, you know, oh, geez, how much do I have to pay for this and some of that. Uh, as, some, as other folks have mentioned, that the Cruz has mentioned, a big problem is lack of transportation, especially for older adults, you know, or just any adults who don't have transportation, they have to take several buses to go to a site. So the idea is to bring sites to them, you know. Uh, and many sites here in Virginia were somewhere open eight to five on. I say where, because they begin to break that down. They were open eight to five, Monday to Friday. Of course, Latinos, like, you know, like a lot of people are still working and they just can't take off work because a day of work means a day of pay. Um, uh, you know, can't take off to, to, to go and uh, get vaccinated. Then there's this concern about the requirement for ID and recording the names. First of all, you know, as, as Dr. Cruz mentioned, they are, uh, many are trying to remove that, that and, and they are removing some of these uh, uh, issues. But, you know, once again, we, the Latino community, you know, that this is routine. This taking of names and ID is routine in, vac in the vaccine protocol. It is so that we can have a how many have been getting vaccinated, how many have been vaccinated, and also in case one of these uh, uh, vaccine uh, dosages is, is, for example, uh, not strong enough or, 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 or there's something wrong with it, they can notify you, they can notify, you. or if somebody reports side effects and they can notify the other people who receive the same bottle, let's say. So this is routine. We, uh, for, for decades, we've been collecting the names and, uh, and, and, and contact information to get vaccinated, even when they're kids. But the Latinos also, you know, they lack the, the, the family physician that they can just call and just go. They, they, they usually don't have a usual source of care. They just go through whatever they can whenever they get sick, you know. Uh, that's been uh, significantly uh, improved by, by community health centers that serve, you know, thousands, probably millions of Latinos throughout the United States. So many Latinos get their care at community health centers. And this is a great service uh, that they provide. Uh, uh, and uh, bilingual uh, Latinos uh, are, are providers, nurses, physicians, and, uh, and other caring physicians of, of any other uh, group. Well, uh, then there's a more very important is the constant exposure to vaccine conspiracy theories, myths, alarmist reports of side effects via social media, TV, radio, in print. You know, just posing the, it's interesting because you can see reporters on television and, and they post the question, they say, oh, I've heard this. I wonder if that's true. Well, geez, you know, they had time to get an expert there to say it is true or not. But just posing the question also already causes the doubt. I, they do it that on purpose. They know what they're doing. So I've seen many te uh, television reporters or even on social media or on the radio, uh, uh, you know, hear them, oh, I heard that this happened. I, you know, do you know if it's true? No, I don't. I, I, I wonder if it's true. Well, bring a, a person with credentials from the health departments to solid time to answer your question immediately. But no, this is part of this, uh, uh, you know, spreading these rumors, these alarmist rumors. It's very, very damaging. Next slide. Well, you know, so how do we overcome vaccine hes hesitancy? That How do we help that small uh, percentage of people that are still hesitant? Well, we have to neutralize misinformation with evidence-based facts promoted by credential, recognized experts. Uh, you know, uh, talking about credential, in the previous administration, we had a physician with great credentials from a great university saying nonsense. Well, this guy had, didn't have the credentials. He was a radiologist, I believe. He didn't have anything compared to Anthony Fauci, who is a, a disease especially who has been in the fight against diseases since earlier than the 1980s. So, uh, you know, then we had another guy who was an economist discussing vaccine epidemiology. This is, yeah, they're both, well, one is a PhD, a doctor, and the other one is an MD, a doctor. These are not credential. So we have to be very careful about that. Then the other thing is all the statements are not equal. You know, my, uh, you know, what the one, uh, some people say, well, it's alternative facts. Somebody's opinion 
that the earth is flat. It's not the same as somebody's opinion that the earth is round because one other one is not factual, might be a lie, but at least it's not factual, whereas the other one is true. So all the statements are not equal and we, not, we have to separate the wheat from the chaff in that sense. We have to use the full range of media to promote vaccines, which once again, organizations such as NACOA and many of the organizations present here have been using them. They're using you know, uh, websites and uh, use their own websites. They're using Facebook, Twitter, blogs, posters, articles, everything to, to promote vaccines. The same thing with the health department. They have been putting out posters and things like that. So we need to get in there, but especially in the media, where a lot of young Latinos and just Latinos are exposed to, for example, Facebook. Uh, we also have to learn uh, and, and to, you know, to tune out, tune out self-promoting celebrity experts that lack credentials and promote beliefs and opinions and cures. You know, uh, even if the guys, even in my case, you know, I'm, I'm there as a doctor, well, you know, then take, don't take my word for it just because I'm a doctor, you know, just go to the next line, which is go to the CDC, to NIH, university health centers, uh, their websites, call the local health department or go to the website of the local or state health department, ask your family physician if you, want, if you have one, call a community health center. That's where you get credible information. Not from these celebrity experts who are really promoting their own stuff. And many of them are promoting their own websites, promoting their own books, and some of them even promoting their own cures. Very dangerous. We have to tune them out. We have to drown them out. Um, and then we have to dismantle the barriers to our, of the structural racism. You know, many, many of the sites that say, uh, for example, uh, in many states, uh, it says uh, um, information in Spanish, you know, in Espanol. When you click on it, the title says something. This is information about the vaccine and everything else is in English. You know, there are many, uh, uh, many barriers of structural racism. We need to uh, uh, overcome them, dismantle them, make them aware. Dr. Cruz just mentioned that he, you know, he was getting in touch with the Biden administration to fix some of these uh, issues. That many times they're not malicious, they're just there because they were there for decades. You know, it's just that people have to change. And we have to promote equality and equity in vaccine programs. Definitely, that's, you know, obvious. Next slide, please. <clears throat> well, you know, how has the, <clears throat> how has the uh, uh, Latino community, the Latin American community responded? Well, they mobilized Latino leadership at the national regional local levels. You hear a lot about, uh, you know, about local folks uh, that are well known in the Washington DC area, well known in Texas, well known in California, many states. And mobilizing this Latino leadership is important because you, you need to hear it from them. Uh, you also have mobilized, and this is happening also, Latino influencers, celebrities, science and medical experts that have been promoting the safety, the efficacy, and the, back, and the benefits of, of a, a vaccine. I mean, she's not Latino, but just today I noticed that uh, Miley Cyrus is showing where she got vaccinated. Miley Cyrus is a big, big person especially for young people. And, you know, just showing that you got vaccinated goes a long way. That's very important. And also, you know, we have to start, uh, we have to continue promoting vaccines in churches, community health centers, and, uh, you know, call out those, uh, and, 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 you know, maybe you want to meet them in person, those few uh, church folks who are, you know, uh, uh, against vaccines because they say it's been made with fetal tissue of aborted babies. Well, first of all, that's not true. You know, so, you know, you, you, you can just show them that this is not true and, and show them the damage that they're doing by preventing people from getting vaccinated. Are you going to change people's minds? Uh, maybe, hopefully. Uh, and, you know, we have uh, Latino agencies, Latino organizations produced, and there's not enough because, I, you know, I walk around in Latino neighborhoods, I don't see enough uh, pamphlets, factions, posters, videos, everything is still not enough. And, you know, because we, we want to build uh, acceptance and confidence and trust in the vaccines. Uh, and of course, we, have, we want to empower the acceptors and limit the damage of the refusers. If somebody said that, I thought I would quote them directly. Next slide. Well, where and how can you get vaccinated? Probably the more important slide. 
you just Google in, in Spanish, you can enter in the Google site, where can I find a, a vaccine against COVID in the, my city and the state? You just enter that phrase. Donde, donde pueden encontrar la vacuna contra el COVID? En, en uh, qué sé yo, en uh, Montgomery County in, in Maryland. Y ahí te sale, and then you get this complete list of, uh, of where you can get the vaccine. On your computer, on your browser, on your iPhone, you know, on your smartphone, you just put that vacunas.gov or vaccines.gov and boom, immediately you get a menu of sites, phone numbers, places where you can go in your state, in your city, in your locality. I hope and I wish that every Latino, Latino service agency would have the, the would, would put the widget in the, in the front of their, you know, in the very first page of their website of this, the CDC widget, which is the vaccine finder. In that widget, you click, you put on your zip code and boom, it immediately tells you where you can get vaccine. Heck, go and ask your local pharmacies, CVS, Walgreens, supermarket pharmacies, use them, they're professionals. Just ask them, where can I get vaccinated? They might just tell you right here, or they will just tell you where. Those are resources that every Latino community, every community has. There's pharmacies everywhere. Ask, they will tell you. They know they will tell you. You know, we have to identify, uh, identify obstacles, break them into smaller pieces, you know. I was reading some uh, a, a guidance on one guy, how to tackle big projects. And he said that, you know, uh, what you have to do is, uh, is, is, is break any big barrier into smaller pieces and surmount and overcome each one and learn from the experience and share with others. So therefore, whatever organizations are, Latino or Latino serving or minority serving organizations, uh, there's their finding and please share it with others how you have been able to overcome them. And of course, health departments, the CDC, Latino agency, others have phone numbers, as Dr. Chris just mentioned, to call for bilingual information. And lastly, there is the 1-800 number, 1-800-232-0233 for the National COVID-19 Vaccine uh, Ally Assistance Program. This is this uh, this program, you, you you call them and they will tell you exactly where you can get your uh, your vaccine. So there are resources; they are there. We just need to use them. We need just need to promote them. That this phone number is very important piece of information. If you just put it everywhere, Latinos will call and they and they're multilingual. You know, they're answering any language. Next and last slide. Well, uh, you know, just uh, just want to read, uh, you know, read, read, read. Oh, English is so hard to pronounce. COVID is deadly, especially among uh, older adults and those with coexisting conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, asthma, HIV, and you know how many people, especially uh, uh, minority populations, suffer from very high rates of these uh, comorbid conditions. That's why their mortality is. Uh, uh, rates for COVID are also high. Uh, COVID though affects all ages. Now we know everybody get, can get it. Hand washing, masks, and physical distancing are effective. It's not just because somebody says so. Tests have proven, experiments have been done. They have proven that they are effective in, in preventing the spread of the virus and of course preventing the disease. So they are good and they are effective and they're easy to you know handle. And also, as I keep in mind that those with mild and worse with no symptoms of COVID can infect others. So there are, you know, health or people that feel healthy or don't feel too bad at all going around and hugging their friends or, or their, you know, abuelitos or, 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 or any adults who are, you know, at home is one of the places where you can get infected very easily because people are in close quarters and because they know each other, they feel, oh, well, you know, I'll come in contact. Oh my gosh, my battery is running low, it says. Eh, how could I be? This was plugged. Okay. Um, in any case, uh, and you know, to achieve herd immunity, we need at least, you know, at least close to 70% of the population needs to be either immune, either due to vaccination or infection. We're getting there, but we're not there yet, very close. And COVID vaccines are available in the US, they are safe and they are very effective. That we know. And so we can use them. And now we know that anybody over 12 should be vaccinated. And there's, there's just no, 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 no even waiting lists. And there are no, you don't even have to be a, a, make appointments. There are many places that are just, you just walk to it, you know, 
and just walk in and you'll get your vaccine. Thank you so much. I appreciate your patience and let me plug this computer. Although it should be plugged, but once again, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dr. Pacheco. Um, we've all had those technical difficulties, so I hope you In the middle, find, right? yeah. Yeah, find, the, find the plug situation. Yeah. Um, we will have a couple questions for you, but we'll save those till the end. So thanks for folks who sent those in. Um, but I am pleased to introduce our final panelist, Galila Selassie, who is a staff attorney at one of um, the Diverse Elders Coalition's partners, Justice in Aging. She works to help state advocates improve access to long-term services and supports and home and community-based services. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Galila has been working with state and national partners to prevent discriminatory crisis standards of care and to ensure that COVID-19 vaccines are fairly allocated to communities hit hardest by the pandemic. So welcome, Galila. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, yeah, it's great to go last because I had all these brilliant speakers say all these great things and really energize me, but it sucks to go last because they are brilliant speakers and it's hard to keep pace with them. Uh, but with that said, my name is Galila Slassi. I'm an attorney at Justice and Aging. My pronouns are she, her. And today we'll just be talking uh, about some of the concerns about transportation and receiving the COVID vaccine, looking at what we've seen historically with Medicaid, with uh, especially dual eligibles, those who are Medicaid and Medicare duly eligible, that's typically older adults and people with disabilities, and then seeing some of the best practices in communities and in, uh, in sort of bridging that transportation divide. Next slide. And this is just a quick blurb about justice and aging. We've been around since 1972 and we use the power of law to fight senior poverty. Uh, next slide. And at Justice and Aging, we recognize uh, the impact, the very real impact of systemic racism and structural inequities. And we will continue to do what we can to fight that um, by recognizing the enduring negative effects of discrimination, promoting access and equity, and making sure we uh, recruit and support a diverse staff that represents the communities that we serve. And next slide. So to begin, I know you've heard a lot of data today, but this is data from Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that I found really helpful um, throughout this pandemic. CMS was one of the um, earlier federal agencies to provide very helpful disaggregated data that looks at people who, like I said, have just Medicare or the duly eligible people with Medicaid and Medicare um, based on uh, lots of different breakdowns by age, by whether they're disabled, if, if they have are, are on Medicare due to disability age, or um, if they have end-stage renal disease, um, by gender. And so one thing that we've been really looking at is the impact of race uh, with their insurance status. So dual eligibles, people who are on Medicare and Medicaid, because they're on Medicaid, Medicaid is for people who are lower income. It gives us a glimpse at the intersection with age and disability status, race and uh, income. And what we've seen is that uh, dual eligible individuals are three times as likely to contract COVID-19 compared to Medicare only recipients and three and a half times as likely to be hospitalized. Um, and we see among Native Americans, Black and Hispanic dual eligibles, they are around uh, well over almost twice as likely in some instances to be hospitalized compared to white dual eligible individuals. So this really shows the impact that race has had on uh, older adults and people with disabilities throughout this pandemic. Next slide. And so what, what is the reason for this? There's nothing that should suggest that being a certain race, having a certain ethnic background, or having a certain income level should, should logically make you ill. The reason for that is nothing in our DNA. It's because of systemic racism and these structural inequities that, that has caused disproportionate health outcomes. Like Dr. Pacheco was saying, that COVID can be very deadly for people with certain conditions. And those conditions, um, like hypertension, diabetes, and so on, can often result from a lack of nutritional support, from stress, from just insufficient support in the community. And so um, we see that these disproportionate health outcomes are not only impacting dual eligible people of color in the way that they uh, respond to COVID, that they're more likely to be infected, to be hospitalized, or to die but they can also prevent their access to the vaccine. And so early on when the vaccines were more limited and we had those phased allocations, 
we wanted to make sure that people with those chronic conditions, older adults, people with certain occupations that are um, disproportionately held by low-income people of color, we were prioritized in getting the vaccines. Since then, the challenge has really been accessibility. Um, so one big part is scheduling appointments. We've heard, particularly early on, how difficult it was, people having to refresh their browsers constantly, being on the phone constantly to um, try to schedule an appointment, even if they weren't in the priority group. Uh, another big problem is accommodations at the vaccination site. I'll talk about accommodations to the vaccine site, but even within the vaccine site, it may not be accessible based on due to uh, physical limitations. If there's something that there's not enough ramps, there's the only stairs, no elevators, very long winding um, hallways, things of that nature, it has to be visually accessible uh, and also need accessibility for people with limited English proficiency, making sure that there's things available in uh, languages other than English for all the uh, main languages of that community. And also to ensure that people who have uh, limited sight, limited hearing, or have challenges with communication can also uh, get the information and express information at the vaccine site. And then what we'll, the bulk of what we'll be talking about is transportation. This is a huge problem for low-income older adults, people with disabilities, and people of color, especially those residing in high poverty areas. And next slide. And so transportation really is a health equity issue. It isn't just about getting from one place to another. Um, we've seen many studies that have shown that millions of people miss or delay medical appointments each year due to a lack of transportation. There are uh, Medicaid regulations that covers non-emergency medical transportation. So that's not necessarily the uh, ambulance to the emergency room, but even just to go to the doctor's offices Medicaid should be covering that. But even then, we are seeing some, uh, some uh, challenges with how that's being effectuated. And um, the, the real equity point to make here is that over 40% of women, nearly 40% of women over the age of 75 do not drive. And people of color on Medicaid often reported uh, poor health outcomes and a lack of medical care due to issues with transportation. Uh, there was a study done in, I believe it was Iowa's Medicaid program that showed uh, how much more likely certain communities were to have, uh, were to meet, were to have unmet care needs because of transportation. And that number was 83% higher for Blacks on Medicaid in that area and 31% higher for Hispanics in that area compared to people who identified as white. So it's a huge trouble problem. Uh, next slide. And so with the COVID vaccine, what we're trying to do is avoid some of the mistakes that we saw with the COVID testing sites. In most instances, the uh, testing sites were centralized, which assumes that everyone has access to a vehicle. Typically, they were the drive-through ones where you stay in your car, get the swabs, um, and, then, and then wait in an area for your test. And while that may be good for people who do have cars, we, it created massive disparities for folks. Even at once the test became readily available, there were still communities that could not get tested. Uh, one example is in Washington, DC. There were five public testing sites for the district, but two of which were drive through And in DC, 30% of white households lacked access to a vehicle compared to 40% of black households and 43% of Hispanic households. So again, you're seeing in these cities that really rely on public transportation, the inequities of having um, uh, of not having of having these drive-through sites that that assume people have transportation, and it's a problem nationally as well. About twenty percent of Black households across the country don't have access to a car, and uh, twelve percent of Latin households don't have access to a personal car as well. And uh, next slide. So this is just a quick map of the mean travel times to testing sites from. Um, the link is down there at Story Maps. And what you'll see is that the areas in yellow represent where travel time was three hours or more. Orange is two to three hours. The pink is one to two hours. The big purple regions are 15 to 60 minutes. And the blue is less than 15 minutes. Um, and so you can see a lot of the big cities, there's lots of blues. One interesting point uh, during uh, Sarah's talk earlier is if you can see across the western part of the country, you see a lot of pinks and oranges and yellows. 
um, and even some purples. And so that's where you can, where we saw a lot of trouble uh, for Native Americans accessing the vaccine. And as we know, a lot of uh, in, across tribal lands, there are problems accessing care as well um, and disproportionately hit by the COVID vaccine. And the uh, tribal community has lost so many elders unnecessarily because of these accessibility issues that we could have prevented as a society. And next slide. So moving forward, transportation must be accommodating and reliable. Uh, accessible and reliable transportation is a priority. And that means that when we prioritize transportation, we're ensuring that it is, a that, uh, it is timely and done with relative ease. If someone has to call five, 10 different phone numbers and wait for 30 minutes to schedule an appointment at a doctor's for a doctor's appointment next week, that's not done with relative ease and that's really not accessible. Similarly, when we're talking about transportation, it can't be like when the cable guy is coming to install the cable and there's like a four hour window when they might arrive. That also is not appropriate for this population. And then on top of that, when we talk about accessibility, we're also talking about making sure that the vehicle itself, you can't just call an Uber or a Lyft or a cab and expect that to be the uh, transportation this person needs. It needs to ensure that there are proper ramps and lifts and other physical measures taken so the person can, be, um, can travel safely. It's also really important to have proper fasteners. It's not often just seatbelts with older adults and people with disabilities. Their chairs may have to be fastened. If they have oxygen tanks or other equipment, that has to be properly fastened as well. Uh, announcements and messages should be relayed in, uh, in multiple languages as needed or in the language of the rider as required. And also make sure it's accessible for people with limited vision or who are hard of hearing. And also it's really important to allow space for support persons to travel. A lot of people with disabilities and older adults do rely on a support person. That support person may not be their chauffeur. They may not be able to drive them places. They themselves may have problems with accessing vehicles, but if they're helping them with their equipment, if they're ensuring checking their vitals, if they're giving them medication or whatever the case may be, that support person must also be able to travel with them. So these are the big points we talk about when we're looking at accessibility. And uh, next slide. And then looking at some of the best practices to provide uh, safe and accessible transportation for COVID vaccines, We've uh, heard a good bit about the home-based vaccines. That's really important. And one great, uh, another webinar I was on where someone was talking about, let's try to continue this even post-pandemic, right? The, uh, someone called it the return of the, um, of the house call doctor, right? Some of these practices would be great to see continue forward, but bringing the vaccines in person, I know Johnson & Johnson played a huge role in that given that the um, temperature requirements for storing it was, much more favorable for transport to the homes. Um, and so that's one huge improvement in, uh, in uh, vaccinating these vulnerable populations. Another big one is uh, mobile vaccine clinics have been really helpful. These you know big old trucks that come around to certain communities and rural communities to make sure that people are vaccinated. Collaborations with community organizations is huge. One of our state partners was talking about how their um, local hospital system actually partnered with a predominantly black church um, in a very high poverty part of the state. And they, it was about two months before Easter and they started doing this um, get vaccinated at a time for, for Easter campaign. And they come to the church, they discuss all their concerns about the vaccines. They'd have local doctors, you know, answer their questions, give them information. And then they um, had the vaccine clinic about a block or two from the church, which made that transportation part really easily. And then it was sort of tied to, you could be vaccinated by Easter. You could be able to come to church safely, see your family safely by Easter. And so that was a really great example of really comparable uh, community-based partnerships. And then also because it was done through a particular grant from the state, those community-based organizations were actually reimbursed for their time and effort and space that they lended, which is really important. Um, and then another huge thing, Dr. Cruz mentioned this earlier, that recognized the differencing between vaccine access from hesitancy. Early on, there was justifiably, uh, I think some concerns and some hesitancy about the vaccine research process. And what does this mean? I'm not talking about the misinformation, you know, very out there concerns, but just a matter of 
is this safe? And I understand why those concerns existed and they were very high among communities of color. However, um, what we've noticed is that as time went on, those concerns became less of an issue. Once people started getting vaccinated in phase one and phase two, there was less concern among, especially among older adults that, oh, what does this vaccine mean? And yet we saw that older adults, especially older adults of color, weren't getting vaccinated at the rates that they should have. And that suggests this was more of an access issue and not a hesitancy issue. Uh, recently, the CDC posted the most recent vaccination rate since mid-April, and it shows that 51% of those vaccinated in the US were people of color, which is higher than the rate was for the general population, which is around 40%. And the fact is that the vaccines around the time that this increase, drastic increase in people of color getting vaccinated suggests that if uh, the vaccines had been open to more people of color earlier in the prioritization process, then you probably would have seen those numbers earlier. So instead it was when states opened up the vaccines to all eligibility that we saw communities of color getting vaccinated. Um, so that says a lot about the access issue. We've also seen great results for um, older seniors and older adults of color with the vaccine. The uh, infection, hospitalization, and death rates for uh, among older Hispanic adults was dropped about 80% and dropped about 70% for um, older Black adults. So these are very, very encouraging numbers. We got to make sure that we continue supporting transportation for these dual eligibles, Medicaid populations, both during the COVID vaccine process, but also making sure that we carry this forward uh, for ongoing care. And next slide, I believe is the final slide. Great, so if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me and uh, thank you all for allowing me to be here. Thank you so much, Galila, and thanks to all of the panelists. Um, we have about 18 minutes left. So I'm going to move us into a Q&A with everyone together. So I think we could take the slides down. We'll be sending those out after the fact anyway, in case you missed them. Um, but let's just dive into some of these questions for our panelists. So uh, one of the first questions I saw, um, I'll actually direct this to Dr. Cruz, but um, one panelist mentioned, I heard something about Uber and Lyft providing rides for elders to vaccination sites. Is this true? If so, when does this start? Thank you, Lauren, for that question. And uh, yes, we actually have um, a partnership with Lyft and with Uber. And so if you are in need of transportation anywhere around the country, including Puerto Rico, please call us and call the number that um, has been uh, shared on the on the chat um, for that assistance. And, and we'll be happy to give you the code and make arrangements um, so that folks can get to the uh, to the vaccine location. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. I know a, a lot, there are a couple different access points as well. So if you've heard um, about these Uber and Lyft rides in your specific community, there might also be another local community partner near you. So wherever the access point might be, you know, we encourage you to get that. Um, but NACOA's resource hotline is a really great starting point. Were there any other um, panelists on the call who have like a number they wanted to um, promote or a number with other language access opportunities? for Uber and Lyft rides? No, I would just like to add for the Uber ride, it does indicate that it's a $25 maximum and with Lyft, it's a $15 maximum. You can actually do both of those through the app if you have that option, which singles out a lot of people, unfortunately. So thank you, Dr. Cruz for that hotline option. That's a great option. Great, thanks, Sarah. That's really helpful. Just knowing the numbers every, you know, no, it can make a difference if you're expecting a free ride, right? And it's only a $15 um, maximum. Um, I know also our, our partner at the National Asian Pacific Center on Aging is providing rides through their partnership, I believe also um, with Lyft and they're providing some coordination in several Asian languages. So maybe I can ask Ocean to drop that, um, that helpline number as well if you have Asian American or Pacific Islander folks who are looking for that um, resource into the chat. Um, another, so another question that we 
received um, while we're on that topic, is this Lyft and Uber service available in rural areas? Um, I am, I'm personally not sure. I imagine that it has to be in a place where there are riders available, but Dr. Cruz, do you happen to know any more information about that? It is available. And um, if there are specific regions that you'd like to um, inquire about it, please call us and we'll make arrangements. If we don't have something there, we'll make arrangements. So um, please, please call us. Great, thank you. Um, another question that I saw from a, an attendee was, I live in, a, in an assisted living center in a rural suburban area and the nearest vaccination site is at a community college. Our local transportation does not travel that far. Are there any resources where I can find transportation? Um, so I imagine this is a question about specific resources or also if folks have insights on where that person should look in local government, et cetera. Yeah, this is Galil, I'll jump in real quick. Um, I know, I wish I could give like a one website or one number sort of call, um, but I think another great resource is probably the local county health department. Oftentimes they will have specific resources um, for vaccinating homebound, especially now that we're at the phase where um, the vaccines have been opened up, that frees up a, a fair amount of time to that. So I would suggest contacting local county health department if there aren't any other sort of one-stop shop numbers to provide. Thanks, Galila. Um, any other folks wanna chime in on that? Well, I would I would call the, the center that's offering the vaccines and uh, ask them that question. Do you do they know of any transportation? Because they might also know. They might know of somebody. And sometimes these centers have volunteers, you know, who are who are helping out the in the vaccine, who will uh, uh, you know volunteer and say, okay, give me the address, I'll pick up a person. You know, and so they they will they'll know. Okay, so and so is going to pick you up. So they'll. So they'll know it's not just some random person. So good thing, it should also call whoever's offering the vaccines with that same question about transportation. Great, thank you. And that's a really good point um, that made me think of Sarah's presentation that there's often these sort of like creative community partnerships going on, right? That right. are really specific and local to your local community. Um, another question, Similarly, around resources is where can I find resources for home-based vaccines or alerts for mobile vaccine clinics? Is there a resource for that? Um, any panelists are welcome to join, chime in for that, even if it's not a specific answer, but just like a place to start looking. Well, you know, for mobile places, uh, the best is the local health department, you know, because they know who is out there doing what because they, you know, they are in charge of knowing what's going on in their locality. So the best would be uh, uh, the local uh, city health department, the local health department to find out, you know, where are there any other mobile uh, set, uh, units? Yeah, um, and I, I, I agree with Dr. Pacheco. I think the local health department is a good place to start. Um, there are some uh, areas, agencies on aging, that's a government agency that's um, contracted to serve certain, commu every community, but it can be like a tri-county area region versus a county-based one. And they often have um, good resources for seniors on transportations, even outside of the pandemic. So they may also offer some insight about um, where to go to for um, homebound vaccines or, or rides to vaccines. Thanks, Galila. Um, I had a question for Sarah. You pointed out so many really amazing community partnerships and things that were really creative. I mean, I think in a lot of community-based work, we always say meet people where they're at. And it seems like you very literally were meeting people where they were at in grocery stores and physical locations throughout town. Um, I'm just curious about like how some of those partnerships were formed or how they've been evolving um, throughout the pandemic and how do you continue to let the community know as services evolve? Sure, well, in that regard, now I'm a, a fly on the wall of incredible people that I've witnessed working seven days a week, 16 hours a day since the pandemic started. So here's a cheers to all of our healthcare providers 
um, and our, our public health workers who have certainly put a lot of those key things, you know, into place, reaching out to our taxi service providers and everyone in that area. Um, you know, a lot of it really just started with having a key picture of where the boundaries lie, what, what don't we do well in whatever organization it is that we serve and who is doing that really well. And just reaching out and, and creating those conversations, I think was just a really big piece of, of kind of starting to create those, those partnerships. Um, for, I'll give you a really good example. We have a wonderful healthcare facility here called Family Healthcare. And they are putting together a mobile vaccine clinic that will go around to some of our communities, maybe some of our lower income family community housings throughout the area. I think someone brought up a really great idea of, yeah, I'm sure that they're doing like mobile alerts. It is really unfortunate that there isn't like a national resource database, like who do you go to for homebound needs? That is just not something that exists possibly because it's something that we didn't know was needed. I don't know. That is not my expertise, um, but it is a really good item to bring up because if there is that need, you know, then it's something that we need to advocate for. And I'm, you know, confident that most public health facilities, you know, will respond, you know, once they are aware of those needs. So really it's just understanding those boundaries, being aware of the need, and being able to, to start those conversations and make those connections. Um, you know, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. I think it's just really important. I know we have a variety of folks on this call, but just to remember that when you do notice something in your community that's a service missing or an opportunity that raising your voice about that can really have a lot of impact for you and also for your community. So I love that framework. Exactly. And it's really just about really just being a good neighbor. For a lot of the homebound individuals, it was their neighbor calling up and saying, hey, my neighbor needs the vaccine. <laughs> Can you call them? <laughs> and, and that's just been a really big piece of being able to look out not only for those individuals who have barriers to either mobile or internet devices, but might not be able to advocate you know, for themselves, you know, in that regard. So always ask questions. <laughs> There's somebody out there willing to help you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I know we have only just a couple minutes left and I see three very specific um, sort of sciencey questions around the vaccine that I'll direct to Dr. Pacheco, but I think, um, also any, so there's three questions. One is how effective is the COVID-19 vaccine, especially Pfizer compared to Moderna and Johnson and Johnson compared to Pfizer and Moderna. Also, if I'm vaccinated, should I continue to wear my mask outdoors and or around others who are not vaccinated? Mm -hmm. Dr. Pacheco, I'm wondering if you could briefly touch on those, but then also just where should people go to for reliable information as this is gonna be a continuously evolving um, situation? Yeah, for reliable information, just Google CDC. You can put your question the way you just mentioned it and put CDC and you'll get the uh, CDC answer. As far as the, rely, uh, the the effectiveness of the Pfizer and the uh, Moderna vaccine, they are in the 90s, 94, 95%. You know, it makes no difference. It's not, one is 94, 95 in the 90s. Now, Johnson & Johnson is only one shot, first of all, that's the benefit, but it's in the upper 70s, 74, 75% and uh, of protection. Now, all of this is protection at, at least two weeks after you've been vaccinated. So Johnson & Johnson is a little less, but in a community where there is present COVID and the only vaccine available is Johnson & Johnson, I would definitely get it, no doubt about it. Uh, what was the other question? Uh, oh, should you still wear a mask? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, 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 the CDC guidelines, uh, the last one says that once, once you're vaccinated, that uh, you don't need to wear a mask, you don't have to, maintain a distance, uh, except that you have to follow the, 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 the local and state and, and, and jurisdictional uh, regulations. And uh, the thing is, the question is, you never know if you're around fully vaccinated people or not. You know? So I think the question says, if I, 
if I'm with people who are unvaccinated, you just don't know. But if you're fully vaccinated, yeah, you can start not wearing a mask, especially in public and open spaces, you know. Uh, when it comes to science, you know, we have to, we, nothing is a 100% and things change. So we also start getting the public accustomed that, that science is not black and white, you know. Uh, people have headaches, people take Tylenol. It works on some people, it works, it doesn't work on others, as an example, right? So this thing about the, the wearing a mask or not, some people, some, uh, not people, some researchers say, well, could it be that, for example, uh, uh, it is possible a vaccinated person could still uh, come in contact and have the virus in the throat, but it's not causing any disease, it's just in the throat. That person goes uh, and, and, and hugs or comes in close contact with a family member very close who's not vaccinated, well, then you could give it. You know, those are the, 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 some of the exceptions that people are looking at. But in general, all of the CDC guidelines says, no, you don't have to wear it in public, in open spaces, and among other vaccinated people, uh, if you have been vaccinated. But you have to follow your local laws. I don't know if that's clearer. No, thank you. I think that's a really good point. You know, it's it's really, we do never know about who's around us. And so that's why I think it's really important. I, I did drop in, as you suggested, suggested, Dr. Pacheco, your the CDC link in the chat for any folks who just want to be sure they're hearing not only reputable information, but the most up-to-date information um, exactly. at the federal level. So because that can change, you know, next week. I mean, exactly. it's possible. It's not it's not uh, confusion, it's just that that's the way nature works. They are constantly researching these things. Yes, exactly. And while the situation might be evolving on the ground, we do, or, you know, it, it's hard to find completely up-to-date local information, but we do know that we will have the most up-to-date federal information available at the CDC website. Um, we have about three minutes left, so we're gonna wrap up with one final poll from Kim before we close up. Thanks, Lauren. Our final question is what other resources regarding vaccine access would be helpful? Uh, so you have the choices there. And then there's also an option for other. And if you could fill in your responses in the chat, that would be very helpful. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share the results. So you can see information regarding the safety of the vaccine and reliable sources for vaccine information were the top responses. And I'll turn it back over to Lauren to close us up. Thank you. Well, with our last two minutes, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to our amazing panelists. It was not only you know super informative, but just love hearing um, love hearing all the energy and all of the solutions that are community driven or community responses. And I think, you know, Sarah, I really love the image that you left us with of just neighbors taking care of each other, people looking out for each other. Um, so hopefully we can hold that as we move forward into the rest of our day. Thank you all so much for joining us. I hope that um, if you need more information, you can visit diverseelderscoalition.org um, or any of the sites of our, spot, of our partners on this call. And we'll be sending out slides and recording shortly. So have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Bye. pleasure. Bye-bye.